A mistake can happen everywhere, but please make sure that you report as soon as possible. We nowadays see that they use threads of phishing mail with already known contacts. So if then somebody you know sends you a mail and has an urgent question, yeah, I would fall for that. They try to put as much pressure as possible. Sometimes they will call your clients. Sometimes they will directly involve the CEO and give him a message. We know where you live and we know the school of the kids. They say that they do a good job, that they help the company and that they deliver a security report. You have to pay money for that. So it's like the Robin Hood in a new code or something like that. This is the Human Firewall podcast with Dr. Niklas Hellemann. So today is a very, very special episode with a very special guest. I'm welcoming Inge van der Beel. Is that correct? Yeah, that I is tried correct. It. I yeah. tried it. She's a cyber resilience expert at Northwave and is specializing in fortifying organization against cyber threats. But that's not the most interesting part. The most interesting part is that Inge is actually involved in negotiations with ransomware criminals. And on top of that, she is also an organizational psychologist and expert in change management. So today's episode is a little bit of a therapeutic session because you are listening to two psychologists. So welcome, Inge. Super, super happy to have you here. Thank you so much. Almost on a therapeutic chair. I can, yeah, this, I can is, this is like how we learn it in school, right? <laughs> yeah, so, indeed. Uh, I mean, so first of all, let's talk about your family. No, <laughs> this is how, how a therapeutic session would actually begin. No, but I would be super interesting to kick it off. I mean, we have so many topics to talk about and especially about ransomware negotiations, uh, which we will do. But I mean, I can feel it very well myself, this transition coming from psychology to cybersecurity. Everybody keeps asking me that, like, how did you get into that? And obviously, I want to ask you the same question. Yeah, and you need to answer that one as well <laughs> for me. How I, did I get into it? I worked for many years at, you know, that's a research institute. And in those years, I worked many years for the defense and security and safety part. So the security part was always there. In uh, 2008, I also joined the army for one year. We had a really close relationship between TNO and the army and went to Afghanistan. So I always had kind of a feeling with security, but then I became a manager and led different management teams. And after 40 years of TNO, I was at the point that I was thinking, okay, I can do this much longer, but maybe there is also some interesting things in the outside world. And a friend of mine said, oh, you need to talk to Nordway because they are starting a new unit around cybersecurity and behavior and it really fits you. So long story short, I had that conversation and I was completely fond of the company. I really love the culture we have. And I love the assignment, building a completely new unit around cybersecurity and behavior. Uh, so this is the story. Very exciting. I definitely want to also hear some experiences from Afghanistan, but let's maybe put that aside because one question remains, like why is psychology and behavioral science even so important in security? It's a, it's a bit of a stupid <laughs> question, but I mean, it's, it's yeah, something it's, we need to discuss, right? It is something we need to discuss. And I think the most appealing example I have in my own company, we had an incident when I just started at Nordwave. We had an incident with a child care company who had a policy, don't let your laptop at the workplace, always bring it home. But they had a party, so they took the decision to let the laptops at the workplace because that was their assessment. It is more safe there. In the end, that evening, the company, they broke in the company, took those laptops. And one of the business consultants in my company said, yeah, but there is a policy. Why don't they follow the policy? And their behavior comes in place. Mm -hmm. I think we need to look from a different perspective to cybersecurity. In the end, as you already mentioned during one of the talks at Tuvicon, 90% of the breaches is related to human error. So we need to take those humans into account and teach them, learn them, take them along with the risk the company is facing or the threats the company is facing. This is something we learned in university, right? That, yeah. that knowledge doesn't equal behavior, nope. right? 
and it's so funny because we know this for, I don't know, 70, 80 years of school research, essentially, where we, we also don't have the assumption that we just download knowledge into pupils' brains and then they will react accordingly. Yeah. We need to work with them, right? Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Indeed. You mentioned HoofyCon, so maybe as a little bit of context and you can hear it in the back, we are recording this podcast on our Human Firewall conference that we also initiated because of that observation that a couple of years ago, the security industry was very, very I would call it technocratic, right? Focused on technological barriers and the human layer people were just a weak link or the, even the weakest link. Is this also something that you need to educate people on a lot that actually the opposite can be the case? Yeah, what we always say, you can have your system layer fully protected with all kinds of technical measures. You can have your security management in place. But if you don't create also a human layer that is really strong and helpful protecting your organization, you're lacking capacity. So there is a lot of potential in that layer and we need to use it. So, and therefore that's also the reason why we work together as companies, because we think that SoSafe is really helping in creating baseline around knowledge and awareness regarding cybersecurity. And there's many things still to achieve and to do, but maybe let's put aside the topic of what can we do or how can we leverage behavioral science on the defending side? This will be a very important topic later on, but let's start at the beginning and that's attackers, right? Cybercrime starts with people that attack companies or individuals and they also do so by using behavioral science for, for a bad thing, right? Um, yeah, tell us a little bit more. What are stories, what are hacks that involve the human layer that, that you were exposed to in your professional life? Yeah, many. What we see is that many of the incidents start with a phishing attack. And in those attacks, you see in most cases urgency or authority used to put pressure in the email and to get a reaction from the receiver, putting down their username and their password. And then it's pretty easy access to the organization. We also see it during the attack. We had an attack not long ago where we saw the team that was facing the ransomware node on the screen. And they were chatting with each other via Teams to discuss the situation. And the attacker was still in the network. So they took the picture of the specific situation and conversation in the Teams call. And they used that picture to put pressure on starting a conversation with the threat actor. So they use different ways to put pressure on the, the organization to get in the organization, but also during the attack, get pressure on the organization to get in contact. And they only have one aim, earning money in most cases. So they will do everything. And they are very creative and yeah. they are, you know, something we, we always say, most likely better psychologists than most people in the cyber world or like on the defending side. And this example shows very, very clearly that this is not a matter of, you know, hackers hacking code or infrastructure. They are looking at how people are interacting with each other, what's important to them. Yeah. And, and using that, right? Yeah, they indeed, they use it. So we are all sensitive for things like authority, like urgency. Most of us are really willing to help if you... For example, phishing mail, we nowadays see that they use threats of phishing mail with already known contacts. So if then somebody you know sends you a mail and has an urgent question, yeah, I would fall for that. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, there's various buttons to press. I mean, urgency is certainly something that you mentioned. I think it's also fair to say the higher the personal relevance, yes. is, it also increases the, the, the success. I mean, you have a family, you have kids. I mean, you probably also received one of those very generic SMS yes, text messages from, yeah. from, from your kids, right? And no matter how generic it is, it does something to do, right? Uh, to you, right? And it always a question mark. And even me, when I get such an SMS or WhatsApp uh, via different ways, I was, okay, is this real? And really need to rethink and okay, no, 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 no. And I know the check marks were to look for. But even then, we had a fishing simulation. I felt for it because it's really, really, really good spear fishing. Yeah. So it can happen to everybody. Yeah. And this is something that also can protect you. Just knowing this, that we are being manipulated via emotional buttons. Yeah. And we also know from psychology, I remember this from advertising psychology, yeah. that if you know that you're being manipulated, 
you're being less prone to be manipulated. Indeed. And also what we really emphasize in these kind of situations that a mistake can happen everywhere. But please make sure that you report as soon as possible. And we have a quite close communication interaction within our company. So if a phishing campaign occurs, it directly is visible on Slack, for instance, there's always one colleague that is really sharp and aware. Mm-hmm. So use those mechanisms as well to protect yeah. yourself. Yeah, we talked about early on stage, it's not only preventing a click or a download, but also training your muscle to react, right? Indeed, indeed. And make sure that the follow-up is in place and that people are trained and, and that they do their exercises in a yearly mm-hmm. basis so that the system works behind in that indeed reacting on an, uh, such a incident. Yeah, let's revisit that topic specifically, uh, but let's stay a little bit more on the attacker side. I mean, the, the hacker's mind, right? Yeah. What do you think, why is it, and last year we had uh, Jamie Woodruff, one, one famous ethical hacker from the UK, and he said, your employees are essentially the first and the last line of defense because me, as a hacker, the first thing I'm going to do is starting with phishing. And, and you mentioned it. But why do you think that's still the case? I mean, we are, we are now so much further in technological advancements. And email phishing, really? But why? Because that is the most easy way to get some more knowledge about the organization or even directly get access. And people still tend to take the easy route. They want to make it simple and easy as possible. So if you're looking, for example, at passwords and you still have passwords in your company, you want to have it long and complex. And But criminals know that our mind is lazy and we tend to take the easy route. So it is always easier just to change some numbers, your password, instead of a whole password. Or refer to your family in your password because that's easy to remember. Or put it on a post-it. Yeah. And for <laughs> your... them, it is the most easy way to come into an organization, although the technical measures that are there as well. So mm. it is for them really beneficial. And after all, it is also a, a huge theme that we had been discussing. We are facing a very professionalized industry of yeah. cyber criminals. Indeed. And obviously, I mean, if you look at well-working companies, they are very efficient. So they invest the least amount of money for the highest impact. And then you are probably still fishing, <laughs> is leading the pack here. And what we know from, uh, for example, the Conti leaks during the start of the Russian or the next step in the war between Russia and Ukraine, we saw the Conti leaks, one of the largest uh, groups at that moment. And there we saw that They are really, really well professionalized, organized, professional organized. They have their departments, they have their payment procedures, they have their vacancy, they even have holidays in your... uh, Employee feedback, I heard, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's like a normal organization and indeed well organized in such a way that they even reinvest. So they earn a lot of money, but... Based on those content leaks, we know that 50% of that is reinvested in better client communication, in a better service desk, in better ransomware uh, software, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, they are pretty professional. So what's the net promoter score of (laughs) Conti? I'm curious, yeah. (laughs) Would you recommend it to a friend? (laughs) Yeah. Um, But I mean, let's let's stay there and let's focus on one topic that that is really at the core of your expertise and that is ransomware, right? Yeah. So phishing and all... Phishing is mainly a vector to eventually get money. You yeah. you said that already. But why do you think ransomware is this super important and core monetization model of criminals nowadays? It's also relatively easy. It's just in a safe manner making a lot of money and nothing more, nothing less. And not talking about spionage and things that is also emerging at the moment. Mm. The threats are changing. But looking at ransomware... You buy your access to a certain company on the dark web. You buy, as ransomware affiliate, you buy your software. And based on that, it's like you don't have to be that technical to click and play. And and most of these groups are Russian related and they have kind of safe place there. So it is really easy way to make a lot of money. And that is what you see. Yeah, I mean, you described that, that there are indeed yeah, software as a service offerings on yeah. the dark net. Yeah. Um, so in a sense, this led to the democratization of cybercrime, which is weird because we're talking about these things usually in the 
Startup and Scale of Context, the yeah. democratization of XYZ, in this case, of crime. Of crime, yeah. And we even see it, and we will touch up that, but during the negotiations, during the conversations we have between threat actor and the victim, they say that they do a good job, that they help the company and that they deliver a security report. You have to pay money for that. Mm. So it's like the Robin Hood in, in a new code or something like that. But you see those changes and they promote themselves in, yeah, we're doing a good job for you as a company. It's criminal business. And they're humans and we know from cognitive dissonance yeah. that if you do a bad thing or something that you feel is a bad thing, yeah. you need to somehow reframe it for yourself. So That's apparently... So they did. Yeah. yeah so yeah. they do. Yeah. Yeah. They're the good guys. So we, now we know. We also, I mean, let, let's maybe until we get to the negotiation part. I mean, there's some steps before. So you, I mean, you buy an access on the dark net or yeah. you send out a phishing email and then you infect the system. Yeah. So if we go back like three or four years, this was essentially the core of the model, right? Encrypting data and then asking ransom. Yeah. But it evolved, right? Yeah, it evolved. What we see is that those criminals try to get in, move themselves through the organization and get out. And now not only with decrypted system, encrypted systems are always mixing those up systems that don't work. They always, now not always, but in most cases, steal data. And especially that part is the part that is really not to say need a pain in the ass because a lot of companies have a lot of sensitive data. Think about your employees and all the different things you know about them. Think about your customers with all the information and especially in healthcare or when you're working for the government, a lot of sensitive information is involved and they know that and they monetize that. What what you're describing is that next stage, right? So we had the ransomware. Yeah. And then many companies actually installed backups or implemented backup solutions. I think the, the next step was then initially encrypting the backups yeah. first and then going on the productive systems. And the second step was just extracting data yeah. and threaten the companies with the publication. And what in most cases we see is that first data is encrypted. And then they try to destroy the backups because when the backups are destroyed, they can come mm -hmm. there anymore as well. And then the ransom note is sent. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And something you also hinted at is then triple extortion, right? We yeah. call that double extortion. And the, the other thing, triple extortion, then looking through the data, if it's interesting. And I, I know of a case or various cases actually of psychological clinics or psychiatric clinics where you would then yeah, address the, the patients, right? Yeah, and that is indeed what we see. They, they try to put as much pressure as possible. So sometimes they will call your client services. Uh, sometimes they will call your clients. Sometimes they will directly involve the CEO and give him a message. We know where you live and we know the school of the kids. So that okay. is really, really putting pressure on the negotiations yeah. or the communication you have with the threat act or the situation in yeah. general yeah yeah obviously this is a this is a situation nobody wants to be in and i mean we can only imagine what people will do yeah yeah and maybe that's a good cue for then the negotiation situation right yeah. so i mean personally i would definitely consider going into a negotiation so how does this actually work how, how can i picture this uh, yeah and it's always a hard one because it never starts with negotiations it always starts with only threat actor communication is that then what we call calling you want to have you're facing such difficult dilemmas in such a situation the ransomware attack um, takes on average 23 days your business is down in that period of time and after those 23 days, the basic functionalities are up and running. In those 23 days, you will face horrible dilemmas. One of them is payment, but it is also what are we going to say to the outer world? Uh, what is our uh, communication strategy, et cetera, et cetera. Legal consequences, more and more and more to tell about those dilemmas. Um, but before you can answer those dilemmas or answer those questions, you need to have enough information. And during those first conversations with the threat actor, we want to gain as much information as possible. So we want to know more about who's the group. We want to know more about, for example, what if, 
is data stolen, yes or no, and what data has been stolen. Um, if the systems are um, encrypted, uh, are they able to decrypt the systems, yes or no? So there are several steps and checks you want to uh, make and get as much information as possible to make sure that you can find a um, common ground to have a discussion with each other or to have a communication line between the threat actor and yeah. the victim. Because those pieces of information determine what, what you will actually have as an outcome or your ideal outcome of the negotiation. You mentioned one thing I want to want to deep dive on. Is it like, are they even able to decrypt? So tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, what they say is um, if you pay a certain amount of ransom, and in most cases that are not, there are no small amounts anymore, uh, especially by uh, in situations where bigger companies are involved. Um, you know, to you want to make sure that if you're in a situation that you need to buy the decryptor, that the decryptor works. And so there are cases where it didn't even work. I mean, I paid money for it, so what? It's a yeah, bad product. <laughs> there are more cases known, not mm. only in our company, but there are more cases known that, like, it's not the golden ticket decryptor. It always when systems are encrypted really depends on a group and and the speed etc but um it takes it really takes time to get the systems back up even if you have the key because systems are always broken in some parts or the backups don't fully uh, come together and and the systems don't react in the right manner because it's really time specific or something like that. So um, having a decryptor is not the golden ticket. And if you buy the decryptor, you want to make sure that for the pieces that you um, can use that, that it works, yes or no. Mm -hmm. I mean, a, a lot of complexity. And yeah, you mentioned dilemmas that are essentially many, many dilemmas in, in, in this situation. So can you tell us a little bit more about I mean, a dilemma by definition cannot be solved in a good way. Um, but what are things to look at? I mean, you mentioned some, or, 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 or what, what, what are decisions that are better than others in, in, in this? These situation? kind of situations. Yeah. For example, looking at external communication. Mm. I'm a big believer in transparency. But in a ransomware situation, certainly in the first days where there's no structure and it's completely chaos, like when you have a fire, you know the impact. Yeah. <laughs> in most cases, within 24 hours. Mm -hmm. In a cyber incident, specifically a ransomware incident, it takes about two to three days to fully comprehend the impact. Um, in that situation, telling the media that you are attacked and you're in a ransomware situation, it's not the most helpful thing because they will all ask all different questions and you have no idea. So in these cases, we always say, um, make sure that you have a good basic community uh, communication strategy, strategy and make sure that in the first few days, if you don't have a clue, don't say too much. So transparency to a certain level. Which is pretty much similar to real crime where you also where the police most of the times also doesn't um, publish any details about the ongoing case research so, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Um, and i mean uh, why shouldn't there be a parallel to real crime it's just a different domain and different channel but the mechanics are pretty much similar they are pretty much yeah. similar yeah. yeah and luckily we see see also in the netherlands we had a really big research with the i'm looking for the for the english word the uh, when you have eight in a security or in a um, uh, really nasty accident or thing you have oh yeah like psychological counselors yeah, right indeed yeah and they had them for the physical incidents oh, yeah. mm -hmm. but did not have them for the online incidents but the amount of online incidents is twice as much as the physical ones so nowadays, you see that also that support, um, victim support, is in place for online incidents. And I think that's a really good step. I do absolutely agree because um, we all know, and we talked about emotional triggers, um, like being the success or like being the victim of a successful social engineering attack can have a huge impact. Um, sometimes we receive uh, mails and obviously we uh, route them or we try to route them to to the specific authorities that ha just had been 
um, victims of, for example, Roman scam. And imagine like you just fell for a Roman scam and you just realize it. There's so many ways. I mean, maybe you are in love with a person that doesn't exist. Uh, there's a lot of shame because obviously, you know, in your point of view, you made a very stupid decision, but um, it can happen to many, many people. Um, so I, th I think this is, this is super, super uh, relevant to have this type of emotional support, right? Yeah. And especially because what I didn't know is that the age, the group uh, between 25 and 35 is in most cases the victim. That is the largest group. So it's not the elderly. They are victims as well from for WhatsApp fraud, for instance, but this specific um, fraud or this specific situations are in that young age group. Which actually is, uh, like fits to to the numbers I presented earlier that uh, we we run our, you know, citizen phishing simulations where we also um, correlated with age groups and we see the highest click rate, so the highest success rates for phishing in this, this young specific digital group. native group. Yeah. Yeah. What is your explanation for that? I mean, it's an hypothesis, obviously. So, so the the second highest click rate is in the elderly, yeah, which is probably not too surprising because they're obviously not exposed or have been exposed to too much technology. Um, but I have two two hypotheses. So the first one is if you look at the very young, the digital natives, um, they 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 use social networks, social media that is very focused on oversharing personal information. So they don't question so much putting something on TikTok or doing a be real and, you know, um, that's that's one thing. And the second thing is, um, when I look at myself, I'm in the middle bracket. Um, uh, then my first computer, I need to assemble, I, I really needed to assemble myself. Um, you know, I got the parts, then I put it together and then it always crashed. And I wanted to play the latest games and it always crashed. So I really needed to get into what happens in this, you know, back then, gray box. You also know the gray box. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And really understand what's happening behind the hardware and the software. And nowadays, if you're a digital native, you're also growing up or you have been growing up with a, you know, very high degree of usability and, and technology. An iPad or a, a regular pad doesn't really crash anymore, right? So that's a little bit my my explanation. So these 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 age segments they are more consuming technology, and and are less proactive about yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, I can agree with that. Yeah. yeah. So the problem really, will get bigger. Right? Yeah. Uh, maybe one one thing I want to touch, which um, is is also I mean you talked about uh, dilemmas, um, and obviously paying is the last resort. That's also what. Um, Uh, John Noble told us who who was uh, here on the podcast earlier. Um, so it's the last resort, but sometimes yeah, companies need to do it or individuals uh, need to do it. There is some, and you also talked about radical transparency being very open to it. There is some interaction with regulation. So if you put heavy fines on data um, privacy breaches and and on, I think in France, they discussed Uh, paying ransom being illegal or prohibiting it, this has a direct interaction with that dilemma. What's your take on it? It is quite interesting because nowadays regulation is not that strict or explicit that payment is prohibited. So, and there's no uh, regulation or thing that is helping you if you're in such a situation. So if you're looking at the dilemma that you're facing, indeed, I completely agree, don't pay criminals if you don't need to. But in some cases, it is a question of life or death. And then in such a case, I can understand that payment is an option. And if you restrict that, then you will see a lot more companies that just fall down because there is not an mm. alternative option. So it is really, really a hard dilemma. If we go to the situation that legislation is there, uh, we really need to also grow a support system for companies facing such an incident. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that needs to be the prerequisite. Also, maybe coming from regulation, gently pushing companies into a direction to increase their resilience. Um, but a very specific question um, that I always like to discuss is, will would the prohibition of ransom payments solve the problem even? You already said it during stage as well. Uh, they will find another manner. Mm. Um, they have found a digital way to to easy make money. 
and they will, f- I don't know the manner yet. Mm. It's really nice to have another conversation to, on that as well and to have some thinking and philosophing, uh, it's philosophizing ab- about that subject, but uh, they will find another method. Mm. Yeah. And, and if it's just selling data, which doesn't give you that much money, but I mean, it's already there. There are various monetization models um, that, that, are, um, that, that are out there. Um, so uh, every year we publish our human risk review and um, uh, there we have various statistics. And uh, indeed we asked, because there's, there's, there's very few numbers out there, we asked um, security professionals whether they paid ransom already. And I think the number is 39%, so more than one third um, they they actually already paid uh, ransom one time, and amongst smaller companies, it's almost fifty percent. So it's also a reality. Yeah, what we see in the incidents where we help, we have more than two hundred incidents a year, ransomware incidents a year that we uh, support, and it's really growing because the number of attacks is growing as well. And we see indeed half of them pay, and we help mid-size to larger organizations or multinationals. But in these cases. They pay a more than half time. Yeah. 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 And um, so that's another manifestation of that huge pressure that is on these companies uh, in a situation like this. And yeah, uh, in especially small companies, they fight for their existence. So we, we touched it uh, earlier. Um, so what can we do? I mean, what, what, what could companies do to yeah, lower the possibility of being in that terrible situation. So, I mean, we know in psychology too that prevention is always the better thing to do. But yeah, then, you know, people drink alcohol and smoke cigarettes still. Yeah. So what can we do? Of course, the human layer, but not only. So we'll elaborate a little bit on the other aspects. Uh, what we always say, make sure that you have proper backups, not uh, in contact with your network because then there is an issue as well. So make sure that you have proper networks, uh, back, proper back, uh, proper backups, um, network segmentation, also really important. Make sure that, for instance, you have your incident response and uh, crisis management plans in place and not only in place, exercised and trained and make sure that people know how to react. Um, have a certain level of awareness within your organization and there so safe uh, peaks around the corner. Uh, I think you need to have a certain level of awareness within the organization. People know uh, need to know what are the threats you're facing, what are the risks you're facing, and what are the things you can do uh, as an employee to help you uh, to help in protecting the organization. So indeed, the human layers is is important as well. Yeah, and, and uh, th- there's one word involved in the term human layer, and that's layer, right? Yeah. You, you said it, and, and we wouldn't we wouldn't be at all saying, okay, uh, security awareness and training is the solution. It's just an one, additional layer yeah. that, that I mean, we have to admit in security that in the last 10 years, probably we ignored a little bit. It is not really easy. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Moving to that behavior, getting a cyber safe culture within your organization, it's not an easy question and technical solutions. That's really explicit, off. black, white. Yeah. yeah. You put it on or you put it off. And even security management, we have our policy in place. So mm. we follow the ISO and, and that's perfectly fine. But that human layer, I think it's really unused potential. It's it's interesting because in the beginning, uh, we sometimes had this discussion, you know, the, you know, the, this technology, technologically obsessed um, a cybersecurity scene saying like, yeah, but if only one, I mean, even if you have a click rate of, I don't know, 2%, just one person needs to click. Um, but for an, for a secure email gateway, we, we obviously don't lead that discussion, but there's also, uh, you know, there's not 100% um, Guarantee, sec- yeah, which no. is never the case in security. So it just makes sense to put more layers with appropriately high uh, 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 security next to each other, right? Yeah, indeed. You need to have that combination. You have, and we always say, you have. To, you need to have measures on business bites and behavior. So, the organizational, the technical, and the human part. Uh, and if you let those fit with your risk profile, then you are as safe as you can be. And that's not hundred uh, percent, but it is as safe as you can be. Mm-hmm. 
and let's stay a little bit more on the, um, you, you call it cyber safe culture, <clears throat> which is a topic we are obviously discussing with our customers and, you know, in the industry, security culture. Uh, when we started, um, you know, so if six years ago, five, five and a half years ago, um, I would say the main standard was still, you know, the, the, the phishing simulation being very associated to penetration testing. So once a year, once every two years, and then we have our metric and yeah, okay, now no, we're safe. Now we are getting much more or that mindset shift has, has, is in full swing, um, uh, you know, working towards security culture. That's also, I think 99% of our security professionals we surveyed in our human risk review tell us security culture is the main goal in security awareness and training. But it, you mentioned it's hard, but so what, what are some approaches we could take from behavioral science? We really believe in the fact that you have to have a certain level of awareness as a good starting point. Mm -hmm. So that's also where so safe come in, comes in. We use learnings to get that, create that sense of awareness and to create a certain uh, knowledge level. But we add two things to that, and that is leadership and landscape. So you want to have a landscape where cyber safe behavior is the most easy route. And if it's not an easy route, be open about it and explain why it's not an easy route. Uh, make reporting really simple and therefore I like your phishing button in, yeah, the, uh, fish assist, in yeah. The, yeah, the fish assist. I was looking for the word, sorry. But besides the learnings and the landscape, uh, we also focus on leadership, mm -hmm. formal and informal. They play a really important role in the culture of an organization. And if they pay attention to cybersecurity in their monthly meetings nowadays or now and then, or by talking about their mistakes they were making in, in the last couple of weeks or months, it's really helpful in creating a more cybersecurity awareness and sense, okay, this is important for our company. So learnings, landscape and leadership. Let's put that into context because uh, oftentimes I get the question, so how, how are you actually applying behavioral science and psychology in, in this uh, topic? And, and you specifically described it. It remembers me, of uh, of motivational psychology, which was one one degree where we said, okay, what's the what's what are the levers of behavior or the ingredients of behavior? You you need to define a certain behavior, so you need to know what is that secure behavior yeah. that you wanna that you wanna actually influence and and, and change. You need to have a, a motivation to yeah. show the behavior, yeah. and then you need to lower the barriers for showing that behavior. And this is exactly what you just described, yeah, right? Yeah, so that combination, I think, is the kind of the golden ticket towards mm -hmm. indeed that more cyber-safe culture. Yeah. And again, it's not easy. It takes time, but you need that time to make sure that, that human layer is in place as well. Mm -hmm. And it's probably also, I mean, it takes time and, it, and it's not a project that will be finished. In no, a no point, it's right? continuously. Yeah. It's continuously. The threats are changing. The risks of your company is changing. You do merger and acquisition. You get different employees. So you need to be continuously aware of that changing surrounding inner and outside the organization um, and need to adjust to that. So there's always new information to share. Yeah, which is, I mean, not a, not a very pleasant thought. But um, on the other hand, we are also not installing an antivirus or EDR tool and then let it let it run the scan and then deinstall it again, right? But that continuously changes fact of life, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, it's part of the hygiene in the organization. Yeah, and let's maybe. I mean, I'm using, I'm looking for a segue for the next topic, but I mean, we talked about emotions, and um, we just talked about the security industry and 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 other other tools. Um, one theme and one topic we had been been discussing here at at Hufikon very intensively is the whole um, state of cyber professionals. So, I mean, the talent shortage, but then also the mental stress. Um, if you if you uh, tell us a little bit more about your, your daily work, I mean, this is also an area where psychologists can, you know, understand better and, and then also, also maybe see patterns. Um, what, what do you think? Like, tell us a little bit more about that, that whole thing. I can cho choose different angles, but what we know from fact is that, for, for instance, the tenure of CISOs is two years and two months. And the percentage that is uh, having stress complaints is over 50%. So those numbers are enormous. Um, then when you put it in a situation where you have an incident, 
you can imagine that not only already the existing existing stress is there, you're in a situation that is new, that has really, really um, high stakes. Everybody is looking at you as a CISO or IT department. You need to solve that crisis. So, um, and you're out of control because you have no idea. And those elements, and you'll also know that from a psycholo- psychological perspective, no control in an unknown situation is really dramatic. We know very well that 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 uh, the lack of control actually directly leads to depression. Yeah. So what's the term? Acquired helplessness or something like yeah. that? Yeah. Summary this Long for time me. ago. Yeah. Um, Even longer for me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of the factors that makes people um, depressed if they if they can control a situation and um, especially if you are looking at a you know unknown threat a constant threat that that does something to you and and also on a physiological level this this is a very slippery slope into into burnout or depression right yeah is there something that we can do to support our fellow CISOs and 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 colleagues open a conversation yeah, mm-hmm. that is the, the starting point. I'm really happy when I, I'm at uh, board level, uh, we have done many exercises or even during incidents, you see that the subject of cybersecurity uh, is really a topic that is for the board table. So that is really a good starting point. Um, and make sure that you as a CISO make explicit what the risk is Open that conversation with your board and make sure that you get the budget to have the people and the support you need uh, to fix the organization, to make sure that you're as secure as you can be in a situation where you're in. Um, And I think opening that conversation, getting that awareness and understanding on decision level is really a good starting point. Mm -hmm. And and also like think about the numbers from our report. I think 56% of all the surveyed cyber professionals tell us that the attention of the board has increased. Yeah. So that's a good that's news. That's a good thing. Yeah, that's a good thing. But still, it's half of them that, that don't feel like that. So what can we do to, to even further raise that attention on the board level? Yeah, what we do many times are dilemma sessions, for example. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, make sure that you have uh, stories around uh, for companies that are alike or uh, in the same area and uh, ask those companies to tell stories about what happened and how they uh, managed it and how they feel about it. To create that conversation to make sure that um, also on board level there is awareness. It's no longer, okay, it's not going to happen to me. And many companies know that they are potential victims. So you need to create that conversation. I would absolutely agree. And if I think about the the conversations that we are having with our customers, it has improved over the last couple of years. So, I mean, luckily or unfortunately through real attacks. um, uh, And it never works better than a situation where a competitor got hacked. Then usually you have that immediate attention. I think the challenge is to keep it on a certain level because um, I, I think John Noble also told us that, you know, you have an incident, you spot it, and then if the, the attackers just stay in your system and don't do anything, I mean, sometimes, you know, attention just moves on, right? So we need to keep the attention on level because it's the new normal we, we are currently living in, right? Yeah, indeed. And and that you need keeping that conversation open, make sure, and, and therefore in uh, platforms like so safe. With those micro learnings, making sure that you have the continuous attention for the subjects in light and um, not really intensive manners, nothing more than needed. Um, it will keep the subject alive and kicking. But indeed, the sense of urgency just behind, after an incident is really different than when you're two years and you're completely functioning as an organization. That happens as well. Yeah, yeah. Then that's also the balance we all need to make between the regular business and then also keeping resilience. You know, time flies. Um, but maybe just as as closing our our, our episode of today, um, I mean, two two psychologists talking about psych- uh, cybersecurity. Um, what would be your your wish or your message to 
your your fellow cybersecurity professionals from the point of view of a psychologist? I really want to ask them, put yourself in the user, his or her shoes and ask questions. Go sit next to somebody uh, who is working on the front desk and ask them, uh, how do you report an incident and get an idea about what is working and what's not working. Have a conversation at a coffee moment and uh, ask about, okay, do you know what the risks in this company are and do you know your role? Open up that conversation. It's not like the employee is not willing. In most cases, they just don't know. What a nice final final statement. So actually don't treat your people as, as, as the weakest link. Treat them as humans, as yes. they are, right? Yeah, and then indeed. they will help you in defending yeah. your company. They are more than willing to. What a nice end to this episode and thank you very much Inge for for being here today and obviously to all listeners if you liked our episode today which I'm very very sure of then please leave us a review and also subscribe to our podcast so you stay up to date um, of any upcoming episodes and tune in soon and thank you very much again for tuning in The Human Firewall podcast by SoSafe is produced by Early Studios. 